coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. Like I just posted today about not having to count calories if you eat the correct right. foods, right? right? And, and I th- but then I, I completely understand and appreciate people in the beginning of their journey wanting to count calories because they have to understand food. You want to right. quantify things and know like, oh, this is what a steak is or this is what an egg is so that you know. So yeah, I think that that's important is, yeah, do a test with all these type of things. CGM, do a test. You get to know a lot and then you don't have to do it for the rest of your life. You, you just know and you understand and then you, yeah, you're more in tune with your body because so then you can see it you're like, oh, wow, I ate this. My blood sugar skyrocketed. Then it crashed and I was tired. And then you kind of put some data to your feelings and then you know to not do that again. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed Brian Sanders, who's a filmmaker behind the feature-length documentary Food Lies and host of the Peak Human podcast. He graduated from UCLA with a degree in mechanical engineering and then used his technical background and love for fitness and nutrition to work as a health coach and be the co-founder of the health media and technology company, Sapien. He also owns nosedetail.org. And on this episode, we're going to touch on everything to live optimally through ancestral eating with modern science. We also touch on his Food Lies documentary, Nose Detail Nutrition, the importance of protein, Brian's anti-aging diet, how important are veggies, and principles behind the sapien diet. Lastly, we talk about eating meat and its effect on the environment, and we also give his one tip to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. A lot of great information packed in here, and thanks so much for listening. All right. Well, welcome to Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. This is my second interview. And I'm with um, Brian Sanders. Uh, he is out of LA and he's a filmmaker. Uh, Food Lies is coming out. We'll talk about that. He also has a podcast called Peak Human, which I, was, uh, which I listen to quite regularly. And um, a few other companies. One is uh, Nose to Tail, which we can talk about as well. And I have ordered from you as well from there. Nice. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to have you on. Well, thanks for having me, fellow Brian here. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Yeah, we both spell our names the right way with the I. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I figure we just um, start off with, I'm, I'm curious to how you got into um, where you're at and, um, and then we'll touch a little bit on, on, that, on your documentary that's coming out as well. Yeah, well, it's sort of this long road of me discovering that I wasn't doing well. And I kind of, I was in that mindset of, I think everyone else in the country where they just, you get older and you just gain a little more weight and you're just not as athletic and things are harder and you have more and more little problems that you just deal with. And I thought this was life. And then uh, I had a wake up call. So a lot of people have wake up calls with themselves when it's too late or with family or friends. Uh, So mine unfortunately was with my parents and they both were, just going downhill. They, um, I basically lost both my parents around the age of 30. My mom had stage seven Alzheimer's dad cancer, and I didn't really connect it with their diet and lifestyle because most people just think it's more about, you know, type two diabetes or obesity is, is, is more easily connected to diet and lifestyle. But then I started getting into this research and realizing, hey, our, you know, native living people, our ancestors, our modern people living the way we used to live, don't get Alzheimer's or cancer. And I took a look at their diet or how we how I was raised and how we just ate. And we, you know, we followed the food pyramid. We did, we made our own food. We weren't going out to eat a lot. We weren't going to McDonald's, you know, it was this rare special treat. And we just were making our own food, lean chicken and rice. I grew up in Hawaii. We were doing all the the healthy diet things, you know, eat brown rice and and vegetables and lean chicken and low fat products and this and that. And it just did not serve us well. It did not serve me well. I was eating that way into college and, and beyond. And 
just was had a terrible body composition. It just wasn't working. And I, and to skip ahead, I made a few simple switches in my diet. I never counted calories. I didn't do much at all. I've always made my own food, but I just, as people say, do the opposite of the food pyramid. You flip it upside down, that type of thing. Just go to more ancestral eating, whole foods. And my entire life and body changed. And that really led me down this path. I decided to make a film. I did the podcast, did so many other things. And it was just all based on just a simple idea of eating like a human. <laughs> and it, it seems so simple now. I'm like, well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really do much, but everything changed. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, obviously having a wake-up call like that, you don't want to have. Um, but sometimes, uh, I would say most people w wait till it's almost too late to make a change. Um, like my story was not quite like that, but in the sense, I mean, I just turned 40. I was, I've always been in, a, in pretty decent shape and, and ate clean for what I thought was clean. Um, but like you said, it, as you get older, it's like you almost, you have to work that much harder to get the same results that you got when maybe you were in your twenties. Um, and that was sort of part of the reason why I wanted to do the podcast as well was because I'm seeing, you know, friends, family, they get into their thirties and forties and fifties and they keep doing the same things that they were doing when they were younger and they're just not getting the results that they were getting. And one of the things for me was intermittent fasting, uh, something that, um, actually I had a client of mine who, who was like pre-diabetic and she got really got into fasting and, and the results were just unbelievable. Um, and that was just something that really struck me. And, and so I've gotten into that along with ancestral eating, um, learning from guys like yourself and, you know, Paul Saladino, I, I actually used to be more of like a pescatarian and I've changed my ways a bit. Um, how did you get into ancestral eating? Was there someone that you looked up to or, you know, did you read a book or watch a documentary or, you know, what sort of clicked? Yeah. Mark Sisson. He's okay. the man. I feel like uh, anyone who's seen him wants to age like him. He, uh, he wrote the primal blueprint, which is kind of like a Bible on just ancestral living and, you know, came out, I don't know, 12 years ago. And so, I mean, I read it like seven years ago and that really led me down this path. And he, he lives a life. I mean, uh, my dream was to, you know, play ultimate Frisbee with him. Not that I'm a big ultimate Frisbee guy, but I just know that's his thing. And so we filmed with him in the, for Food Lies. We went over to Miami where he is now. And this guy was running around with 18 to 25 year olds, mm -hmm. keeping up with them, just outrunning them, catching Frisbees. It was amazing. And so, yeah, I, I, still, uh, I still want to be, you know, Mark Sisson when I grow up, I'll say. But uh He's big, but I mean, there's hundreds, there's a hundred other people that right. uh, I've interviewed. I've probably interviewed 150 people by now. So there's many more in the space that are living well and doing all these practices. And you mentioned Saladino. I was just with him in Austin and, you know, he's out there sprinting and, you know, we're, we're actually, I, he was barefoot. I, I went barefoot until I was in seventh grade and they made me wear shoes. But, you know, you don't have to go barefoot to live this primal <laughs> yeah. sort of ancestral lifestyle, but it's uh it's cool to see all these people doing really well into their forties and he marks 65 and yeah, doing amazing. Yeah. And so the, what led you to, to get into the food lies documentary? Um, and how long has that been process going? How long has that process been going on for? Yeah. Well, it's actually been over three years. It's mm -hmm. a slow process. I, I was into film growing up. And I was always into just different things and gaining different skill sets. I was a mechanical engineer by trade in college. I got into tech and then I started getting back into film and I saw What the Health three years ago. It came out, I don't know when it came out, but in the, in the summer three years ago, uh, I saw it and I was like, this is terrible. I mean, these people are just making a documentary on <laughs> false information on just a vegan bias on animal rights. It's basically an animal rights film disguised mm -hmm. as nutrition and environmental science. And it, I don't know, I just thought I had to do something about it. So that's really the story. <laughs> so you went down that path and just started interviewing a bunch of people in that space, right? Yeah. I mean, it, that's why it's a long, slow process, right? I just started right. interviewing people and it just one leads to the other and new ideas happen. 
new opportunities open and uh when is it yeah, when do you plan process. on it coming out with it when is it it should be uh in the late spring in the summer so this coming year and uh we you know we kind of got a little slowed down by the lockdown we're going to africa we're actually going to go back to our roots and film with some tribes in africa in january so the border closed and, you know waiting for we're going to shoot with an amazing paleoanthropologist in the museum of uh, natural what is it the museum of science and natural history the smithsonian in washington dc so oh. we're waiting for that to open and we just got some more things to film but yeah but, maybe june okay i'm excited i'm excited for it to come out um also another venture knows the tale um which goes along the theme of ancestral eating um and this is actually products that i've been ordering i've been ordering quite a bit of uh from your company and a few other ones that, that have gone this route um, mm. during the lockdown because I've been doing a lot of cooking for myself and my wife and it, I, I enjoy, I've always done that. I think that like, that is just like one good step. If everyone can just start cooking for themselves and know what goes in their food, um, you can make a, you know, you can make some major strides in your health. I'm, I'm obsessed with cooking for myself yeah. and I've gone up and down over the years, but I think it's one of the biggest things you can do for your health and for your budget and for right. anything. It's a great skill set to have. And yeah, nose and tail. I, I always wanted to do it and I partnered with a great ranch that just does everything well, right? Sustainable agriculture, all the grass finish, everything. We put organs in the meat. Part of the reason was that people don't, eat a lot of organ meats. I don't eat a lot. Of, I didn't eat a lot of organ meats beforehand because it's a little weird. Unless you grew up with liver, it tastes weird. Right. right? So we, so we put it in the ground beef and we have liver, heart, kidney, and spleen. In it. So I, yeah, I mean, you don't have to buy it from me. If you have a local butcher or you have a local ranch that does, does process their meat and you can ask them to, you know, grind up some organs. And I think it's, it's super nutritious and I, I don't really believe in supplements. I feel like these, organ meats are natural supplements, right? This is how we lived, right? It's always that ancestral approach. I always check in the ancestral approach with modern science. So I don't know if everyone listening, you know, you don't have to be completely bought into this. Oh, I'm going to live like a caveman thing. Like that's not what I do. Right. And I, I mean, that's not what the film's going to do. And, and some people do get caught up in that. Some people are just like paleo, like that's it. That's all it is. If it wasn't around the paleo day, I'm not going to eat it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good start. And if you're eating a paleo diet, you're eating whole foods, right? And you, right. you're probably cooking for yourself a lot, but it doesn't mean that it's the end all be all, right? We, we can talk about dairy and maybe it works for some people, maybe it doesn't, but it just because it wasn't around in the paleolithic period, doesn't mean modern humans can't enjoy some raw dairy. You know, the raw part is, is a big story, right? It's like people think that they're lactose intolerant, but maybe it's just because they're eating pasteurized, like skimmed milk and all this stuff. But if you eat the natural version of it, it has the enzymes that allow people to digest it well. So there's, there's more stories there, or even just fermenting it into cheese, and then it removes a lot of the lactose, and then it's a nutritious food, and it has great vitamins and minerals that you need. And again, you wouldn't have to supplement if you were eating, you know, all the right foods. So. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and the thing about like companies like yourself with nose the tail and some of the other companies um, with the organ meats and the blends, you can't even taste that, that they're in there. Um, I mean, I can't, I can, and I've tried both blends and ones that are just, you know, straight, you know, beef or whatever. So I think you do a great job of, of making it accessible and easy for people to have uh, those organ meats where maybe they might not want to have a, you know, a liver, I don't even know how you, how do you prepare liver? I don't even know. Well, there's some people, they, they put it in milk that okay. actually, or buttermilk and it helps sort of mellow out the flavor. But yeah, if people want to try liver, I'd say you could just like go to Whole Foods or whatever. You can get some, you know, decent liver and you can cook it in garlic and onions is another way. Just like saute it? Of, yeah, saute it like garlic or liver and onions is sort of a butt of a joke, right? Mm -hmm. But that used to be what sort of grandparents would eat and they understood that it was healthy. Uh, and same thing with like cod liver oil or cod, you know, these are these old antiquated things that it's like all oh, liver and onion. Like I, I think both my grandparents, both sets of grandparents ate liver and onions yeah. and use cod liver oil. And now 
And I used to not get it at all or what, you know, what is this bogus stuff they're talking about? But then I got into this world and realized, oh no, yeah, like cod liver, you know, these are a great source of omega-3s and DHA and this and that. And it, it, it all makes sense now. I'm in back full circle, right? Yeah. Um, well, what, do you, what would you say, like, I'm curious, like your routine on a daily basis, just trying to give people tips and actionable advice, um, you know, like what, what's your morning ritual and then how do you go about eating and things like that? Yeah, I love this because I'm, I'm sort of obsessive with this or I'm an engineer and I'm always trying to think of the most efficient way to do things and, you know, always trial and error, always advancing, you know, changing, yeah. open to new information. So what I found is intermittent fasting, like you said, I think that's great. I don't even call it that. Mm -hmm. you, you could call it condensed eating window, but I don't even think we, we need to call it fasting. I think it's just normal is, is what, <laughs> what, what humans, we didn't just eat 24 hours a day. We didn't eat all our waking hours. Like many people eat from when they wake up to go to sleep. So just by only eating within about eight hours, condensed eating window is what I do. And I think that's normal. And I eat two meals. I think two meals a day is great. You can do whatever you want and there's different contexts. You know, if you want to put on weight, maybe you should be eating more meals per day. If you're in a growth period, if you're a pregnant woman, a growing child or a weightlifter, right. that's a, that's a growth. That's a growth period in, of your life. So there's different recommendations. People, most people need to lose weight or lose fat specifically. And right. there's completely different recommendations. And maybe you should be doing one meal a day. Even if, you know, a lot of people have success doing OMAD one meal a day and whatever works for you, you know, there's all different ways to do it, but my, I, I've settled on two meals a day. And I also have this idea of the longevity diet of like how to eat for longevity. And you need to balance growth mode and longevity mode. So like I said, there's a growth phases and there's that you do want growth, right? People. So people in the vegan world, the plant-based world, they're, they're trying to say you, you should low, lower like these, these growth signals as much as possible and mTOR, mTOR and IGF one. Right. Yeah. And then you hear these guys going on big podcasts like David Sinclair, or there's another guy, what's his name? Walter Longo. I don't know if he's been on a podcast, but they, they're these sort of plant focused people that are really focused on lowering these growth signals, like into the basement though. It's like, okay, I get it. You don't want to always be signaling to your body to grow. I mean, right. that's sort of, more like cancer, right? The cancer, cancerous cells grow uncontrollably, right? It's a little bit the same. You don't want unlimited growth, right. but we don't want no growth. We don't want uh, to like be a... frail and sarcopenic as mm -hmm. we age. And protein is super important for older people. And sarcopenia means you, you lose muscle mass as you age. And this happens a lot. This is a huge problem in modern world is these people... They're, they're on these low protein diets. They're scared of protein. They're scared of animal fat. You, as you age, you can digest protein less efficiently. So they need even more protein and they're wasting away and then they fall and then they, you know, break a hip, then they go downhill and then they die soon after, right? It all is this compounding events that, so you want to maintain muscle mass. Muscle mass is super important. I'm not saying you need to be a bodybuilder so that you need to balance longevity mode and growth mode. So after talking to these 150 people, listening to opposite opinions, listening to David Sinclair, all these people kind of just put together this idea that you want a smaller eating window, mm -hmm. give yourself some time to not eat, right? There's this idea of autophagy is your cells can clean up, clean so themselves up it. when you're not yeah. eating, right? Yeah. And my idea is, is to be during the day, I'll eat at noon or say, we'll just call it noon. And that's the first time I eat. I'll have no calories before noon, but I'm not hungry before noon at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's about to be noon right now. I've not thought about food yet today. So I do have some black coffee, but I will eat a basically like a high fat meal, like moderate protein, low carb, like a keto meal. Mm -hmm. Right. So during the day I want to stay in ketosis I've been fat adapted for years now. So I'm very good at running on fat. My body prefers fat as a fuel source. I did a pentathlon, right? A five, like a, a championship track meet with 
uh, uh, North American and Central American Championships Masters, right? This is a, not that there was like huge competition or anything. It's just a bunch of old people. But I did a championship meet. I flew to Toronto mm. and I didn't even eat before doing this. It started at noon. I didn't eat it all day. And I just did it fat adapted. And everyone there is just guzzling right. like little gels and pro, the, uh, or, uh, what's it called? Those little bars and stuff. Just like carbs. Just like, and, and I just didn't even eat. And I beat, I beat only one guy beat me in the 1500 at least. I came in second in my age group, but I also came in second in the main group in the 15. So I ran a mile without eating all day at probably 4.30 p.m. <laughs> right. So that's just to illustrate that you don't need carbs for athletics. You can be fat adapted, but you, carbs are fine. I'm not saying they're bad, right? right? In certain circumstances or how you use them or all this stuff. So, okay. So I'm, this is the meandering sort of <laughs> explanation of what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm fat adapted. I'm eating at noon. I'm, right. I don't want to eat too much protein at noon. I don't want to have a, uh, make my body, you know, go through gluconeogenesis to, you know, if I give too much protein, it, 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 you can get these growth signals and maybe I don't want them. So I'm trying to get the balance. So I stay in ketosis. I stay, my energy stays high, right? You know, I'm not crashing. A lot of people who eat carbs or especially processed carbs will crash at two or 3 PM. So when you have that high fat meal around noon, what are we looking at? I'll do maybe three eggs and some, I do like kind of classic breakfast meats. I realize breakfast meats are breakfast meats for a reason. I think it's, they're high fat. They're like lower, you know, sausage and bacon are very high fat and lower in protein than most meats. Okay. So I'll do breakfast meats. I'll do three eggs. I'll do some sauerkraut. I'll do avocado. I'll do yeah, yeah stuff like that. I mean, that's, it's like a keto meal, but it's like a whole foods keto meal. Right. Right. And then I, then I, I actually go on the sun and read. I think that's important. Then I go, then I, you know, finish my work day and I work out say 6 PM. Okay. And I work out for about 15 minutes only oh. intense, brief, intense exercise. I do dips, weighted dips, right? I got a weight vest. I'm doing 40 pounds weight vest. I'll do, I don't know. I think I can do 18 dips with the 40 pounds. Then I take it off and then I'll do like 15 more. Right. And then, I, so I, I like this idea of going to failure mm -hmm. and the it's, there's also this idea of hit, right? Most people heard of hit that, you know, sure. high intensity high, interval, high intensity interval training and sprinting, you know? So it's like the, this idea that you can sprint, you can do intense exercise and it's a lot more efficient mm -hmm. and it signals to your body to grow and it's, it's, it's get stronger. So I do that at around six and then I'll eat, a meal and I'll eat more protein and maybe some carbs with that. Maybe some, you know, I don't know, some whole food carbs, or maybe I'll just have some honey or something. I'm just exploring different things. And yeah. so then my, so I'm not in ketosis. I'm like, I'm in growth mode now, right? This is, so I, I worked out. I told my body to get stronger. I'm eating adequate protein, you know, enough protein, meaning maybe more protein and I'm eating some carbs. I'm not afraid of carbs. Right. Some people are in, 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 you know, different animal based worlds, but, mm -hmm. and then that's about it. And then, yeah, just get good sleep. Yeah. I'm always in bed for at least eight and a half hours. I'm giving myself the, the time. A lot of people don't even give themselves the time to get good sleep, you know? No. Yeah, no, I, a, a lot of good stuff there. I mean, I talked with Brad Kearns. He was my first interview he was, with, he was with Primal and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, he talked about those micro workouts that he's been doing. Um, something that actually for me, because I've been lifting for a long time um, and mainly like traditional, um, like in the gym over, you know, mm -hmm. like at least an hour. But uh, you still, as you get older, not even as you get older, you realize you don't really need to go crazy. You can get a good, efficient workout done. And actually something I used during the quarantine because I did a lot of workouts outside in my basement was, um, and I, you might've interviewed him with the X3 was uh, Dr. John. Oh, Jaquish. I haven't. I, I spoke to him briefly on, online once. I don't know. Yeah, I just sort of, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I've, I, I have found that whether it's his system or whatever, resistance bands have been a lot easier on my joints. Um, and uh, so I've been using that. And yeah, like, 
I mean, my workouts are probably 45 minutes just because I rather just make them longer. <laughs> just, well, it's but, good. Yeah. I'm, yeah. You, you can get good gains. I'm not saying you're going to get insane gains by doing only 15 minutes. And sometimes it'll, it'll take me 20 minutes, but right. I have this idea of if you, well, for one, I'm, I'm experimenting. I'm trying to see how, right. how little I can do for great results. And also I think most people don't have the time or they're not going to keep up with it if it's a full hour. So if you know that it's only 15 minutes, so my thing is the consistency of it is great. So I know I'm going to do it every day. I do it five days a week because it's short. I know it's going to be over soon, but I love, I mean, if I could, you know, work out for 45 minutes, I'd be bigger. <laughs> yeah, per se. You know, I, one thing I noticed too, just doing home workouts with resistant bands is like, there's no excuse. Like people make excuses. Oh, they don't want to go to the gym. You know, now, you know, with the quarantines, I'm like, I don't have any, like, I, like I used to maybe do three, four workouts a week. Now I do it pretty much every day because like, there's no excuse. Well, you right. can't say time. You right. can't say time. I, I'm, yeah. People try to tell me they don't have time. I was like, there are 24 hours a day. If you don't, if you can't get some resistance bands and do something for right. 12 minutes in your own home, like while you're cooking dinner, you, I actually do it while I'm cooking dinner. Like I'll start some, some onions or something going or whatever, start the oven and, and work out. And it's, it's not an excuse. No, I agree. And, and I was curious when you did your workouts, you did them at six. Like for me, I do my workouts. I've been, I've been experimenting a little bit when I would like to do the workout. And I usually do mine like in a fasted state. Um, I'll do it maybe around like 1231. And then it's almost like a reward. And then I'll break my fast after that. Mm -hmm. And I've been condensing my window a little bit, um, just seeing how it is. And it's just amazing. The body, like you said, like, you know, um, the body's just an amazing thing. It, it'll like, you know, you ran, you know, you did that race with nothing in you. Um, I think, you know, once you get into fasting, um, or if you don't want to call it fast, it's condensing your, your eating window, mm -hmm. you start to realize that you're, your body will just adjust and it doesn't have to run on glucose all the time. And like, I'm in a fastest state right now, it's 2 PM and I'm probably going to go, you know, you start to be in tune with your hunger. Like what is true hunger? You know, mm -hmm. just an amazing thing. So <laughs> yeah, you, you don't know. It's great. Most people don't understand it. Or even if they're slight, like they could just think about food or you could just smell food and then you think you're hungry, but right. you're not really hungry. And then if people who do this intermittent fasting, like, yeah, you mean you, you're about probably just going to say you might not even eat for a couple more hours because you'll wait until you actually feel hungry. And that's what very few people do in the world. Right. And then, and then you, like you t touched on, um, balancing out like anabolic and catabolic stages, um, growing and, and the opposite. And, um, like, for example, today, my thought was, I'm not going to do a workout. I'm just going to fast all day and I'm going to be in less of a growth mode. And then other days when I'm more active and, and, hit, and do a hard workout, you know, then I'll consume more calories and be in more of a growth stage. I love that. And yeah, yeah I mean, guys like Mark Sisson have been talking about that kind of thing for years. It's variable. It's, you change it up, you listen to your body, you, yeah, it, he calls it fractal too. Like, you know, it's, it, it's all the different sizes and shapes. And if you go exactly right, you're, you're, you're going to do some days where it's fasting and longevity mode, some days where it's growth mode. Right. Yeah, no. So I've been messing around with that. I'm curious. You talk about carbs. Um, I know that like some people demonize them and I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I do have carbs from time to time and avocado is actually one of my favorites. What other carbs do you like to add in? Yeah, I like avocado mushrooms, okay. um, fermented foods. So I mentioned sauerkraut. I think fermented foods are great because you get some kind of probiotic thing. It well, it's something we've been traditionally doing for thousands and thousands of years. And it gets rid of anti-nutrients in plants. So a lot of people don't understand that there are bad things in plants. And I kind of went down this, I got kind of caught up in the kale shakes, spinach mm -hmm. smoothie type of world. And yeah. I had way too many oxalates for way too long. And so I'm sort of off of the green vegetable train for a while. And I've been doing great, right? As people think, oh my God, you have to get your greens. I'm like, I don't know about that. I, I haven't had greens in a year and I'm feeling better than ever. I mean, I'm sure I have had a few 
greens. I, I, I got a, some cilantro a little, you know, every now and then, but nah, you, you don't, you don't need, well, I don't want to say you don't need it, but it, it, we're challenging this idea that you need these certain things like greens, but fermented vegetables will get out those anti-nutrients, like right? the act of fermenting lets the bacteria kind of eat away and it actually gets a lot of the sugar out too. So you're, you're left with something that I think tastes amazing and doesn't even give you that many calories. If you want to talk about calories, I mean, I'm animal based 90% by calories, but I could have a huge scoop of sauerkraut and it's like 20 calories, you know, it's, it's nothing really there, but it's just giving me some probiotics and it's giving me some vitamin C people that maybe not know that vitamin C's and, and sauerkraut and fermented foods, and it's giving me some flavor. It's giving me all kinds of stuff. So, so yeah, I really only eat avocado sau- uh, fermented foods, but that could be pickles. It could be jalapenos, like any kind of just some, you know, fermented or just even lacto fermented, which just means salt, right? It's not traditionally. Do you uh, ferment fermented. your own vegetables? Or? I've tried. <laughs> I'm going to try again. I kind of yeah. screwed it up and then I've been, a little wary of starting again, but uh, yeah, I want to do that. Uh, and then onions. I do onions too. Mm-hmm. I love just sauteed onions. I mean, if you're going to eat a steak, just oh, yeah. the sauteed onions, it's so good. It has some like prebiotic. I mean, it has some, you know, good, good stuff in it too. Yeah. Onions. That's what, that was like the main meal was like mainly sometimes I do fish from time to time. So I'll do, we'll grill like salmon, wild salmon, or um or grass-fed you know grass-finished meat and then saute onions and mushrooms that was like the go-to meal over the quarantine (laughs) it's so good i mean i don't understand how people aren't on this train it is so everyone i make it for they're just like this is amazing yeah and i you know i actually went out to one restaurant honestly probably maybe two two restaurants through the whole like quarantine and and one was like a major steakhouse but you know you go to these places then you eat there you're like god you know what it's just not that good i i would i would i would prepare that ribeye a lot better than that you know 75 dollars steakhouse <laughs> i always say that and think yeah. that and yes 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent um my other question is that i wanted to touch on is uh the sapien lifestyle i know um I was on, I was on your site a bit and it looks like you have like different courses and things like that for people to go through and learn about it. Yeah. So I have Dr. Gary is my business partner and we developed a program Mm -hmm. and we have all kinds of stuff. I mean, you can just go to saving.org, but the idea is putting all these things together and just kind of teaching people how to do it. And maybe they can do it on their own. Again, you you don't have to use our products or services. It's, Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I've never really worried about trying to make a lot of money. Uh, doing a documentary is the opposite way to make yeah, money, right. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it's how to lose money. But yeah, I think they, there's simple principles. I'll just tell you what we, we the sapient principles are. Mm-hmm. Eat Well, the, the diet part is just eat real food. That's number one. If you're eating whole foods, you're there. Mm-hmm. And focus on number two is focus on protein and micronutrients. So the proteins and micronutrients are your building blocks, right? This is what matters. Like every meal should be focused on your complete protein source, which is very, very heavily animal-based, uh, would have the complete sources of protein. And fish is absolutely great. I'm interviewing a lot of people recently on how important seafood was to early humans and this whole idea of this is how we drove our brain growth and how it mushrooms you know that sort of hockey stick growth of our brain over that period of time was due to seafood so a lot of protein a lot of micronutrients complete protein that's number two number three is your energy source is is embrace fat minimize carbs right so just know food is four things it's the protein micronutrients right which is what you focus on and then it's just fat and carbs which are your energy sources and basically everything we've been talking about today is that fat's just a better energy source. So embrace fat, know that it's not bad for you and minimize carbs. He's not saying you can't have any carbs. And the last one is just don't eat all the time. (laughs) It's just the idea of a condensed eating window. So if you do those four things, you're kind of set and you also can kind of make your own diet. I mean, if you're vegetarian, I guess you could do it following those principles. You just be eating a ton of eggs. (laughs) Right. I was, 
down that road a bit. I wasn't like full vegetarian, but I, I did have a problem getting enough protein. I found, you know, I'd had fish from time to time and I was really active and I actually didn't get into eating, um, grass fed, you know, responsibly, um, sourced meat, um, until like probably like the beginning of this year, probably like March. And, uh, I just saw a difference in the way I felt and the way my body looked. I almost, when I wasn't, I, I just, before that, I felt, I, I, I just felt like I was just like underweight a little bit. So, mm -hmm. um, I got stronger, my workouts were better. So I, I definitely found a difference in the way I felt. Well, there's a lot of things in red meat. So the problem is the mainstream media or just mainstream culture demonizes red meat. And that's one of the big focuses of the Food Lies film is showing that all of these ideas aren't really founded on good science at all. And that it's mostly just propaganda from anti-meat people that, and even the WHO, you know, this is the big governmental body. Well, it's not even a governmental body. It's, it's actually just this organization that has sort of an agenda really. And part of their agenda is to d disparage red meat. And they put together a working group in 2015. I interviewed one of the scientists, I had to get special permission to interview this guy who's just a USDA scientist. And he said that they had an agenda that these people it was a bunch of vegans and vegetarians and they, they purposely didn't, uh, the part of the working group is you bring studies to the table and then we're like, okay, let's look at all these studies and we'll make a decision. They ignored his studies. They wouldn't use them. He was like, red meat is not bad. This is insane. We've been eating red meat forever. And he's just sort of this middle of the road, random middle-aged guy that thinks we should eat a very balanced diet and is not even in anywhere near in the meat community, but he just knows science and he knows that meat is good for you and just kind of called them out for being really uh, biased and that they came to this conclusion in a really unfair way. And now everyone sort of quote knows that whole oh, meat causes cancer or processed meat, you know, this and that, this is all based on this one working group from 2015 from basically a biased little working group that so yeah. basically what that's just one little uh, well i could oh, okay we'll talk about the core i'll, I'll do one more thing so <laughs> when we use epidemiology so it only used epidemiology to show this right so for people who don't know that's correlations right you cannot by definition you cannot use these epidemiological studies which are correlations to show causation right to show causation you need randomized controlled trials and stuff like that and so for smoking we did an epidemiology and the, we saw that there was 30 to 40 times the amount of cancers in people that smoked, right? And so we right. so the, were like, okay, this is obvious. Then we did some more studies. And then of course, we realized that smoking causes cancer. Okay? With meat, there was a like 1.8x increase in the supposed cancer, right? Mm -hmm. So- 30 to 40 times with smoking, it was 1.8. So that was a, a ratio of the risk ratio is 0.18. So that, so really if that is so small that it's statistically insignificant. So really in, in science, you're supposed to ignore uh, the study. If there's the correlation is less than two, you, you, it's, it could be due to noise. So you can't really, it doesn't say anything. So less right. than two. So if this was point, this is 1.8, right? 0.18 means 1.8 percent so right. you it, it, and we never had any controlled studies that showed that red meat caused cancer so really there's no reason we should think this and it doesn't make any sense so that was basically a long way of saying is eat red meat uh, it's good for you it has tons of b vitamins and tons of things that you can't get elsewhere and that's probably why you felt better 18. and your body responded Create, yeah, I mean, the carnosine, creatine, there's choline. way more B12, yeah. choline, the, all the C's, the C words. Uh, just, yeah, and it, and it's, it's, it's the great. The bioavailability of the protein as well, right? Absolutely. So vegans will say, oh, you could get protein from broccoli or beans or this. It is not even close. I mean, I don't have all the numbers. I don't remember the exact numbers, but just know it's, it's way more bioavailable. Your, your body can actually use the protein in meat and yeah, it's just plant sources of protein are not complete and they're not bioavailable, right? Doesn't not, they don't have all the amino acids. 
Mm. You have to combine foods to try to get them and they are not bioavailable to us in their fallback foods. This is another concept that I've sort of understood once I started looking back into history is that plant foods are just around when we couldn't get an animal. <laughs> right. The fruit, fruit as well. Yeah. Fruit's fine too. I mean, yeah. fruit's the least toxic uh, plant food. Right. It doesn't have a ton of anti nutrients. And you know, our modern food has a lot of sugar. And so maybe people shouldn't eat too much of it because most people are sort of metabolically damaged in the first place. Right. But uh, yeah, fruits, fr we had fruit and we had meat. That was sort of our basic animal foods. And then we got some fruits when we could, but it, it also wasn't year round, right? It was when they were in season. Right. Eating seasonally. Right. That's a good one. And then, you know, I know you touched on, um, I'm sure you touch on a lot in food lies is, uh, you know, just the environmental factor. Maybe yeah. speak on that a little bit. Cause I think there's some misconceptions, you know, regarding uh, meat. And... That's a big one. Yeah. We, we've hit the nutritional one a lot. We can hit the ethical side too. Yeah. Usually yeah. vegans have the three arguments, but the environmental, the environmental side is that it takes up way too much land, that it takes up too much water and that, we should just be feeding plants directly to people. So that's all false. Mm -hmm. It actually is really efficient. So it takes, so cows for cows are the best example. I'm actually not a huge fan of chicken or pork mm -hmm. because it's, it's not particularly nutritious fish and beef are more nutritious, more vitamins, stuff like that. And it's also, they're, they're not really raised. Well, you know, most chicken and pork is kind of really factory farmed in the way of, in the sense that they're like in giant, rooms you right. know and uh, yeah that the, the, the probably you could find it you could find better quality but i know you guys have it a little bit but yeah yeah we do some good stuff that's actually high well i was gonna say the 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 pufas so the omega-6 right. and omega-3 ratios so if the high level view is we don't want high omega-6 in our diet we want to balance it with omega-3 right. so most people know the omega-3s are good but most people don't know how bad omega-6s are and that all these processed fru foods, all these seed oils especially have huge amounts of omega-6 that we've never seen in our diet and we don't want. And so even with the, the animals, so if the animals, most, like I said, most chicken and pork, they're eating these grains and high omega-6 foods and then that goes into their fat. And in, so when you eat them, you're eating a high omega-6 meat. Right. So grass-fed meat is very balanced with omega-3s and omega-6. And yeah, we do some chicken and pork that's high omega-3, low omega-6. But just know that it's not really raised well. And yeah, it does take a lot of resources too. Re relatively speaking, I guess, you know, if we want to go down this rabbit hole of using resources, I mean, most plant foods have tons of resources involved, especially if you're shipping them around the world, especially if you're using monocropping methods and tons of synthetic inputs and fertilizers and this and that. And right. all foods have inputs. But Chicken and pork, they do have quite a bit of inputs, but cattle or ruminants, sheep, bison, buffalo, they don't actually require that many inputs. They, eat, they actually are miracle workers, I say. They take low quality foods that humans can't eat and turn them into highly nutritious bioavailable protein. So the thing with chicken and porks is because they're monogastric stomachs, their their digestive systems more similar to ours, they need more higher quality foods and more proteins, right? A pig eats kind of the same diet as a human, mm -hmm. but a cow eats a bunch of grass. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's why we should be eating more beef and sheep, you know, bison buffalo because they take grass and all, all these ruminants spend most of their life on pasture anyway, especially, you know, buffalo, bison, she sheep. They're, they're traditionally just on grass their whole life, really. But, you know, cows, yes, I understand we have a CAFO system, confined, confined animal feeding operations. And yes, most cows are put in these, but they're not so bad. But at least two thirds of their life are spent on grass. And then when they are in these confined operations, they do get leftover grains and or uh, corn stalks and all this other stuff from uh, leftovers, right? It's actually a really efficient system where we, we make ethanol, we make biofuels out of corn, and we give the cows the leftover. So it's pretty mm -hmm. efficient and it's not edible. It's, people think, or the vegans will have you believe that there's just these rows and rows of cornfields and it just goes to cows and it actually doesn't work like that. We use 
the the corn for, for something like ethanol and then mm-hmm. give the cows the leftovers. Same thing with distillers. We make a bunch of beer and then we give the cows the leftovers. So they aren't competing with us for food, really, right? Red meat, the one that's most demonized, is the least competitive to, to from the food perspective to humans. We So also we can't just g- give people these low quality foods, like they're not going to do well, right? Their, their idea is, oh, just give the corn and soy to humans. That's not a good diet. No, that's how you get fat. It's very, yeah, it's a very low quality diet. So, I mean, we could go on forever about all the, all the problems with these vegan ideas where the, they, they count the rainwater that falls on fields into the calculations, Yeah. right? They're like, they, almonds require way more, avocados even require way more water than a cow would just getting grass and getting rain. Uh, there's a study that shows that the, the amount of protein that a cow eats over its life, we, they double. When you look at the usability of that protein, mm-hmm. they take low quality protein and turn it into high quality protein by a factor of two, mm. right? So, if, so that kind of debunks this whole argument of we could just eat the food ourselves. Well, humans need protein. That's why I said the one number one thing we need to focus on is protein. Right. This is the building block of our bodies. And if we were eating this low quality plant source protein, we're not going to do as well. And cows double, they, they upcycle the protein, right? They, they turned it into more usable protein. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I know that's a rabbit hole. We could go, probably go down. For <laughs> another there's, so, there's so much hour. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions I just had for you. Um, what about like a cheap food? Um, if you're going to have, you know, yeah. If you're well, going to splurge. <laughs> oh, me? Well, yeah. I'll, so I have this idea that I want to be anti-fragile. I want to participate with society. I want to push the limits. I'm still, I'm, I'm doing fine. So a lot of people in the nutrition world, especially the carnivore space, they have severe problems and they have to eat a certain way. And then they go sure. really hardcore into this rabbit hole and be like, everyone has to be carnivore. And if you eat any vegetable food, you're insane. Mm. Talking about Paul, he's a friend of mine, <laughs> so I'll call him out. But he, but he has eczema. He talks about it all the time. And if he does eat other foods, he does have problems. But right. I think it, we, we can't get too caught up in right. being crazy. And that I can eat a piece of pizza with a bunch of friends on a weekend, and I will actually be fine because my body can. You're metabolically, it. yeah. I'm metabolically flexible. I don't. But I, I wouldn't eat that every day. I mean, when I was eating stuff like that every day, I had chronic problems. I think there's, there's an idea of this chronic versus acute. So if you eat a piece of pizza, okay, I don't think humans do well with grains, right? There's this idea of gluten. People know about gluten, but I think that most people do have problems with gluten, whether they know or not, right? So when I was eating, I never had any gluten tolerance. I was always fine, you know, whatever. I'd live my life completely fine. Mm. But when I was eating grains just once a day, I was chronically inflamed. I had chronic overuse injuries for all this type of stuff. I had allergies. I had all these little things going on. When I just cut it down to, hey, maybe I'll have some pizza once in a while and maybe I'll, you know, whatever. Once, once a week, something happens, it happens. Right. Everything went away because it's that it's acute versus chronic. If you have it every single day of your life, it's bad. Your the human body is pretty resilient and you can have things. So I don't want to tell everyone to go cheat every weekend. And you know, if, right. you're, if you're trying to lose fat, it's not, it's, you're just slowing your progress or you could be flaring up some other things if you have certain conditions. But I would say mm-hmm. I, I'm okay personally with cheating, but really I would say you, you could do some things like dark chocolate, honey. You could get some like keto ice cream. Or, I don't know. You know, there's ways to do it. Well, the thing about it is like, you know, um, if you get into this lifestyle of, you know, eating clean, like we're talking whole foods and nutrient dense foods and doing fasting and this and that. And then I almost feel like, at least for me, like, um, I'll cheat from time to time, but like, you know, like if I went and had like a deep dish pizza, I'd be mm-hmm. feeling it. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, you feel it P- when you're having a deep dish pizza every other day, you're, you're just like, you don't even know the difference. You're not that aware of it. Yep. Um, so for me, like, I don't even want to cheat. I do from time to time, but I, but, but you just, you know, you're going to get right back on the bandwagon and lead a healthy lifestyle. So it's not a big deal. Um, so I always tell people if they're getting into it, if they're just getting into this type of lifestyle, 
maybe save those cheat days because you don't want to go down that hole again. You know, go a month or two or three of, you know, eating pretty clean, whole foods, nutrients that dense foods, doing some fasting, um, you know, obviously doing some being active. And then once you get into that, once it becomes a habit, then, you know, if you, if you cheat from time to time, it's no big deal. I a hundred percent agree. And it also depends on the personality. It's like, I know I'm going to jump back on, right. but many people don't do that right away. And yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I went long periods to get really fat adapted and I guess I did shoot a little, but still you, you want to set yourself up to become metabolically flexible. And then, yeah, maybe if you figure it all out, then you, you will be able to, but right. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And, uh, something I was, um, I know I see a lot on CGMs. Um, we won't go down and talk too much, but those <laughs> are, you know, continuous glucose monitors. I actually have one on me right now. Um, and, uh, just, to, I wanted to see, I think the, the more you're in the health game, it's like, how can I optimize, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, your, what you're doing, you know, your, your health, but I will say the best way to optimize and feel great is just to follow your own intuition and your own, and, and your own senses. Cause like, um, I, I think a CGM is great. Um, but I could also feel it too in my body and like what foods, how, that was the main thing, how, how different foods react and my, how's my blood sugars and insulin levels um, and how they spike and things like that. But it is, it is good to get feedback. I think it's important, especially if you're trying to optimize, you know. I like that. Yeah, I use one for a little bit. I'm actually supposed to try another one soon. But it, it does help to get you going in the beginning. It's the same thing. Like I just posted today about not having to count calories if you eat the correct right. foods, right? right? And, and I th but then I, I completely understand and appreciate people in the beginning of their journey wanting to count calories because they have to understand food. You want to right. quantify things and know like, oh, this is what a steak is or this is what an egg is so that you know. So yeah, I think that that's important is, yeah, do a test with all these type of things. CGM, do a test. You get to know a lot and then you don't have to do it for the rest of your life. You, you just know and you understand and then you, yeah, you're more in tune with your body because then you can see it. You're like, oh, wow, I ate this. My blood sugar skyrocketed. Then it crashed and I was tired. And then you kind of put some data to your feelings and then you know to not do that again. Right. It's like, yeah, no, it's, it, it is, it is, it is a good thing that it never hurts. And like, I know people wear like aura rings and things like that. And I, I try not to get too caught up in all the tech tech rage with the, the biohackers, but, um, but I think most importantly, just follow, follow your body and follow how you feel. I mean, you know, as far as fasting is concerned, um, and condensing your time, you know, your eating window, um, you're going to have hunger, you're going to have hunger pains, especially when, you, if you first start out, try doing it. And, um, you, once you realize that those hunger waves just come and go, and they're really not a big deal. And maybe even just having some sparkling water can actually just help that subside and just keep going. Um, it takes time though. Like you said, for all this stuff, it takes time to get into that rhythm and to, and to be fat adapted. So it, that's a good point it, to get used to it. It's, it's hard. Yeah it's hard for people in the beginning and yes, you probably will be a little hungry and maybe you just do it gradually or push your win right. eating window back just half an hour or one hour each day. And pretty soon just know that the body's super adaptable. It's super interesting how adaptable it is. And th there's all kinds of transition periods people go through, even with fiber or re mm -hmm. removing fiber or people mm -hmm. have problems if they go carnivore and then all of a sudden like Joe Rogan famously was saying he had like diarrhea for, like a couple of weeks or something, but your body goes to an adjustment and, and it's pretty amazing. And I like to tell people too, is this way of eating is so delicious and amazing, but maybe it's just not the same way you eat currently. And you think your way of eating junk food and eating pizza is delicious and amazing, but I'm telling you, this is also delicious and amazing. Mm. And you just need to go through that transition period to get here. And then once you're here, you're fine. It's not like we're sitting here eating steak and eggs and bacon and whatever else and be thinking we're restricted. Right. Yeah, it's delicious. It's great. You just have to go through that process of transition. Yeah, no, I agree. And, um, and be patient. I mean, um, forever, you know, if, if, you know, like for a lot of clients I have, it might, they might've taken them decades to get where they are, meaning maybe they're obese. So it's going to take time to get, to go the other way. And you have to be patient with any of this. Um, and I had one, 
one question I want to, one last question I want to ask you, and you've probably touched on it already, but um, what would be like one tip you'd give an individual if they're, you know, maybe in, in their, their middle age and they want to get their bodies back to what the, what it once was when they were in their twenties, uh, what would be one tip you'd give them? Well, I always just say eat densely, move intensely. So this is my little forward thing that's supposed to replace eat less, move more. <laughs> right. And I think eat All less, right. move more is so stupid. Yeah. I mean, it's meaningless. It's, it's like telling someone how to, how to get rich is just spend less money than they make. Right. Like, all right. Well, that's pointless. So <laughs> if you eat densely, move intensely, it's what we're saying is eat nutrient dense foods and do this more intense exercise. It's not saying you can't go for a walk or go for a jog as well, but really that I guess an even more specific point I'd say on, the, on a good way to eat densely, move intensely is just focus on protein. So that's a one thing. If you're middle age, any time in your life, if you just take, what you're eating and replace some of the empty carbs or empty nutrients, which is usually carbs mm -hmm. and replace that with more protein, you will do better. Right. One thing if people take that away. Mm -hmm. So you could go if you order, maybe it's a little more expensive. If you're going to go out to eat, or maybe it's just, you can buy your own food and it will be cheaper. It won't be as expensive, but just get double the protein and cut out the carb and it will change your life. Yeah. I love that. And that's a simple, actionable tip that it's easy to do. It's easy not to do, but you know, like, you know, get into that rhythm of doing it and then the results will come. So, well, I, I appreciate it, Brian. Um, um, I'm glad to have you on here and I look forward to all, all, all the things you have going on, especially food lives when it's coming out. What, what, what would be a good place for people to find you? Yeah, I'm on all the social media outlets at Food Lies or okay. just search for Food Lies and then sapien.org. You can find everything from sapien.org. It links out to everything. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And um, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate you letting me spread the good word. Yeah, we got to keep spreading it. So thanks again, Brian. Okay, take care. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.